blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
reading from Luke 19 and Luke 23. As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Good Friday is not hard to believe. Easter may be, but not Good Friday, because we live at the foot of the cross. Good Friday is all about undeserved suffering and dashed hopes, disappointment and grief, woundedness and sorrow, the reality of sin and the cost of forgiveness. Good Friday is about injustices done and abandonment of friends, and denial in the face of pressure and fear. This may not be the world we want to live in, but it is the world we understand and can relate to. Good Friday is a world where there is a lot of weeping. And so on his way into Jerusalem, Jesus, the man of sorrows, the man acquainted with grief, stops to weep. Jesus is a person of tears who wept over the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and who now pauses, pauses for a moment to weep over the city. Would that even today you know the things that make for peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. What was it in, that was in his mind as he said these words? He knew what was ahead of him, and the deep sadness he must have felt as he contemplated how his friends would turn their backs on him, and how a city that should have welcomed the Messiah would soon be shouting, crucify him. We know how painful it is to watch a family member or a friend go down a path which we are convinced will lead to no good, and how helpless we feel in trying to get them to come to their senses before it is too late. When Jesus lamented the failure of Jerusalem to do the things that made for peace, was Jesus thinking of those who walked away from him when he offered them the gift of deep harmony? Was he thinking of the rich young ruler who couldn't do the one thing he needed to do in order to follow? Was he thinking of those who harbored bitterness in their hearts because they could not forgive? Was he thinking of the hatreds between the Jews and the Samaritans? Was he thinking how little his teaching seemed to penetrate the hearts of those who heard. Would that you know the things that make for peace. Would that we knew about the things that make for peace in our world, a world where Russians are brutally slaughtering Ukrainians determined not to lose their freedom. Would that we knew the things that make for peace in a world where Israelis and Palestinians are still 2,000 years later, fighting over the land they each claim belongs to them. Would that we knew the things that make for peace in a world where thousands of children die daily from malnutrition or preventable infectious diseases, or where there is still rampant examples of abuse. There's a lot of reason to weep in our world, Jesus understood that, but he wants no sentimental tears, no feeling a little sorry for the plight of someone else without experiencing the tears of repentance which acknowledge humanity's deepest needs and indeed our own. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Jesus knew his mission and was prepared to offer his sacrifice. He did not need our tears for him, but rather he asked that we weep for the sorrow he knew, for our sin and for the suffering of the world, which of course breaks God's heart. 
It's not hard to believe Good Friday, but that, of course, is not the end of the story. Sunday's coming, and there is an end to our weeping. As Archbishop Tutu said many years ago, in the midst of the pain of apartheid, at a human level, I can't be optimistic about our world, but I'm a Christian, and therefore, a prisoner of hope. I love that expression, prisoner of hope. We may live in a Good Friday world, but always with Easter's hope. Thanks be to God.
evening, and I'd like to consider the back and forth between Jesus and Pilate, who was, as we know, the Roman governor of Palestine. We know the story. Jesus is brought before Pilate, and his trial covers questions, all kinds of questions, things about spiritual and political leadership, questions about his own relationship to God, and questions essentially about truth itself. And all the while, Jesus' trial considers the question of authority. Our own present day speaks to the same issues that Jesus and Pilate are debating with each other, particularly the issue of moral authority. Who or what determines what's right and wrong, what's true and what's false? Well, let's take a look at how John the Evangelist tackles the issue of moral authority for Jesus, for Pilate, and for the Jewish leaders. Their give and take in John's 18th and 19th chapters just drips with irony, and it brings them face to face, brings all of them face to face with what's most important. The only one who is rock solid, certain through this, is Jesus. He tells Pilate that his authority comes from above. He knows that God is the one whom he obeys. He knows he's come from the Godhead and is about to return. God is the one whose will trumps all other wills. There is no question for Jesus about who's in charge here. He even tells Pilate, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Now, let's consider Pilate for a minute. It appears that he's not too comfortable with his authority as the governor of this outpost of the Roman Empire. He needs to be manipulated by the Jewish leaders into following through with Jesus' execution. It's not till they threaten him with tattling to his boss and tell him that, that quote, if you re release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. They go on to say, we have no king except the emperor. This statement actually goes against much of the gist of the Old Testament, where the chosen people struggled to own that God was their only king, despite their long history with a series of human kings that they demanded from God, some of whom were very good, and many of whom were just awful. Moreover, during Jesus' day, they were occupied by Rome. They hated the emperor. We see more irony in the statement of the Jewish leaders to Pilate that Jesus ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. And let's not forget the biggest irony of all. They have put God on trial in front of a human judge. Enough said. So, authority. The issue is writ large at Jesus' trial, but it's also an issue that dogs us our whole lives long. It seems to me that we constantly struggle with the question, who's in charge here? It's really what fuels the life of faith, and it fuels all of our, all of our lives and all aspects. Do we seek to live by God's will, knowing that it's our true north star? Or do we pay lip service to the Holy One and let the mores of the time take us where they will? We continually struggle with the issue of authority, and it covers every choice we make. For instance, on what do we spend our money? And why? How much do we value caring for our fellow human beings and for the planet, putting their welfare over our own comforts? How do we choose the candidates we vote for? Who's in charge here? Well, I pray that God will continue to help us struggle with these important and key questions. We have the example. 
example of our friend and our love, Jesus Christ, to learn from and to follow, he stayed true to his God and Father until the end. So, how shall we live in order to be the people that he's calling us to be? Who's in charge here? Amen.
evening and Good Friday. Nailed to a tree, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A disclosure. Much of the thinking in this sermonette was inspired by Reverend Marilyn Anderson's excellent book study of Roots by Leander Lynn Hout. I highly recommend it. Therefore, if some of the things I say rub you the wrong way, um, you can attribute it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a meadow near our house in Lakeville where bobolinks used to nest. The meadow is now gone, and so are the birds that used to nest there. A sprawling mansion was built on the former wildlife habitat and has remained mostly empty for the last four or five years. And meanwhile, the quest for affordable housing continues. Locally, there has been an outpouring of grief and anger at the recent destruction of a grove of mature, healthy trees at Housatonic Meadows. What was not seen, felt, or understood before the decision was made to remove the trees. Happily, new laws are being proposed to prevent this sort of devastation from happening again. Forgive us. When I was a young boy, I loved to climb trees. I've given that up. <laughs> At our home, there was a large copper beach that had low branches. I could swing myself up and then climb to a place higher on the tree where several branches converged and made a wonderful seat for me. I used to go to this secret place, lean against the trunk of the tree, and just sit. I did not think this way at the time, but I see now that I was close to the tree in spirit. We are deeply connected to all of creation, what Thich Nhat Hanh called interbeing. We are made of stardust. All the elements of the universe are in our bodies. When we were first married, my wife Deborah and I ran a small tree service. Part of my work involved tree removal. It was a business. It was a way to make a living, put bread on the table. It was also a service to others. Occasionally, I would try to change the mind of a customer so as not to remove a tree. Generally speaking, however, I viewed the trees as a commodity. I enjoyed figuring out the best way to take down the tree which was often in someone's yard. Tactical challenges were fun. I also enjoyed working outdoors in the hard physical labor. However, I rarely said a prayer of gratitude or acknowledged the life of the tree before I cut it down. For all the trees I cut down without acknowledgement or a prayer of gratitude, I am sorry. Forgive me. When we first came to the northwest corner, we hiked up the hill in Sharon, where there were two magnificent ancient oak trees. Perhaps if you've lived here a while, you know what I'm talking about. When we walked up that hill for the first time, and I saw one of those magnificent giants in front of me, I was overpowered by emotion and began to weep weep irrepressibly. I went up to the tree and put my arms around it as if for comfort. Those oaks are now gone, toppled by age, size, and strong winds. Two new oak trees have been planted for future magnificence. 
amnesia. Have we forgotten how connected we are to the creation around us? How we are part of it and it is part of us? How we need its wildness, its wildness and its holiness? We forget this connection at our peril and that of all creation. It is our sacred duty and responsibility to treat all aspects of creation as co-creatures, interbeing. When we see trees, minerals, meadows, oceans, and lakes only as commodities for our enrichment rather than as blessings, we lose, big time. We lose something powerful and beautiful that replenishes the deep wells in our soul. Today, this day, there has been so much blessing in the spring air. Let us breathe it into those places in our hearts that are troubled or wounded. May it renew our spirits and lead us to gladness and gratitude.
from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding Jesus and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke here gives more pain than comfort. Before paradise come enormous sorrow and excruciating agony. It is a terrible conundrum in this good news, according to Luke. We worship a God of abundance, of healing grace, and at the same time, suffering is the perspective that brings paradise into view. Who would not prefer a paradise sweet with the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven? Who would not prefer a verdant paradise where flora and fauna thrive in harmony, where want and pain are vanished from sight? Those visions of paradise persist, they beckon, they fill up our hoping, but they are not Jesus' vision in these verses from Luke. So paraphrasing Blake, we might question, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon these our mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God in these our pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Good Friday reminds us that bleak satanic mills persist. Not only that they persist, but that our view of paradise comes looking through their hulking, grimy windows. Good Friday reminds us, simply, awfully, that we humans have not stopped crucifying Sometimes we crucify persons guilty of an offense. Sometimes we crucify the innocent. Always. Our crucifixions are a grotesque distortion of the will of God. We crucify guilty and innocent alike when we entrust power into the hands of those who make preparations for war. We crucify guilty and innocent alike when our way of life creates ghastly economic inequities that cause hundreds, thousands of our neighbors to flee the violence of their homelands and beg for refuge or asylum elsewhere. We crucify guilty and innocent alike by closing our doors and our borders to these neighbors. We crucify guilty and innocent alike by relying on fossil fuels and industrial agriculture, even while knowing those choices 
are condemning our planet to catastrophe. We crucify guilty and innocent alike with the plague of gun violence that we refuse to stop. Within all these crucifixions, the Savior waits for us to ask, Jesus, remember me. During seminary, I learned of the Kairos community in New York City. It is a group committed to the Kairos that is near the center of our faith, that time when God's Spirit may transform us from brokenness to wholeness. The Kairos time when we may join Jesus in his passionate journey for righteousness and shalom. The Kairos community formed specifically to protest war and the machinery of war. Several times a year, including every Good Friday, they protested the work of an organization that was developing high-tech weapons designed for maximizing destruction while minimizing risk. The Kairos community blocked their doors. They sang hymns. They prayed to send a message that Jesus refuses the use of violence. Jesus refused the use of violence to defend himself. Instead, Jesus used his own life because you cannot love and commit violence. On one of those Good Fridays, one of the police officers who came to arrest the protesters turned to one of us who was wearing a clerical collar. The officer was clearly distraught that a priest would defile Holy Week with what seemed to be an unseemly demonstration. Father, he said, how can you do this while Christ is on the cross? Officer, replied the priest, you're getting warm. Elsewhere in the scriptures, God demands of us that we stop the crucifixions. The Torah insists we revere God's creation rather than ruin and exploit. The prophets face down the rapacious love of money and power and call on us to do the same. But not tonight. Tonight, God's word inv invites us to place ourselves precisely where the worst of humankind's inhumanity is on flagrant display. There will be a time again to return to the tasks of offering food to the hungry, shelter to the wanderer, solidarity to the vulnerable, resistance to those who abuse power. Tonight, however, is for getting warm. Tonight is for approaching the cross terrible conundrum of our trust in a God who does not will suffering and who knows that suffering may bring heaven into view. Tonight is to remember that drawing close enough to that dreadful hill far away means that we may finally hear the voice we most long for. Today you will be with me in paradise. May it be so.
Fast falls the even tide. We heard the beautiful sounds of the virginal played by Christine. And I've been watching the light falling through those windows in the back, and I would imagine when you first got here, you could see some light coming in through the window, and it has gone slowly, slowly into darkness. And it was dark at 3 o'clock hour in Golgotha. The disciples had scattered. The women were there, but at a distance. And Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Mark's gospel describes the crucifixion and death of Jesus in stark, brief terms. But Mark is also very careful to tell us that this did indeed happen. The loud cry that Jesus gives is the proclamation to us that his death was horrific. And then suffering ends, Jesus dies. We also are invited into the scene to be witnesses and disciples at a distance. Even though our distance is considerable in space and time. Why did God allow this? That's what others have asked, both at that time and for these thousands of years after. If God is almighty, where was God's might to save Jesus on that day? Mark tells us earlier in the gospel that Jesus entered the city that was full of danger, knowing that he was coming to the most holy and most treacherous place. God allows us to have free will to do the right thing and to do very wrong things, atrocities, in fact. We have recently seen a great many atrocities in the destruction of homes, livelihoods, and human life in Ukraine in the last few weeks. Yes, we humans have the ability to create technological wonders and to destroy each other in war. That path is open to us, but it's not God's will. We know God was there at Golgotha, and God is there in Ukraine. A sign was given by God at the moment of the death of Jesus that something momentous had happened. That sign was found in Mark's simple statement that the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple holy of holies, the most sacred part of the temple, held the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of the holy and was kept well protected and hidden. But now it was revealed to the world. God symbolically became available to all people all the time. Mark, in his brief and straightforward way, tells us in one sentence what God has done. Jesus was never hidden from the people, and now with the death of Jesus, we are shown the immediacy of God's love. The Eternal One loves us so much that God lived with us for a time. The temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, and God became Emmanuel forever. Think about what happened with the centurion, too. He was a Gentile soldier, not a believer, was given guard duty to watch over the crucifixion. Maybe he watched over many of these gruesome executions and was there to keep the peace, prevent people from disrupting that state-sponsored killing. Surely in the regular course of his work, he had no concern about the men who hanged there. He was doing his job. And yet, something happened to him as he looked into the face of Jesus as he died, God stirred his heart and made him realize that Jesus was not guilty of any crime. And more than that, 
Jesus was not just an innocent man. The centurion said he was God's son. There was absolutely no reason why the centurion would have to have such a change of heart, and yet he did. To a passerby, it must have seemed that Jesus was nothing special. He died like any other man. To the disciples, frightened and grieving, it must have seemed that all had failed. But there were signs that God was there and that this was not the end of the story. God's plan of salvation for us would not, will not, be thwarted by human sin. stand for our final prayers. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.